Good morning. If everybody can take a seat, then we can start. We don't even fit on the camera. Yeah. Okay, good morning. Um, welcome to another Contributor Talks uh, session. We've got five uh, speakers this morning. Um, the first one up is Quentin Groom from the plant at Tuin Meijse. Uh, and he'll be talking about European taxonomist in profile a data-driven approach. If you watch Daphne, she'll tell you when you've got one minute left. Okay. Let me click that. Hello, everyone. Um, so, yes, I'm trying to profile taxonomists and, and taxonomy in Europe, uh, looking um, at, oops, looking at um, uh, the demands and the supply of taxonomists and potentially uh, how that can potentially be used uh, to uh, inform institutions and policymakers on where they should put their funding in, uh, for instance, in uh, taxonomy. And I should also give a shout out to Melanie Denolf and Sophie Mears particularly, who are uh, really leading on this project. And uh, also, if you're interested in, the, in the, what we're doing, I should also point out David Fischmuller, who's been doing a lot of work on gender in this. So, uh, taxonomists are on a spectrum. They probably don't like to be thought to be on a spectrum. They probably also don't like to be classified, which is kind of ironic. Um, but on the one side, you've got taxonomists who provide a service to the biological community, um, describing species. And on the other side, you've got the hypothesis-driven taxonomy, looking at the process of evolution, of biogeography, etc. So they do all sorts of different jobs. Some of these jobs are more on the service side, some are more on that hypothesis-driven science. Uh, they describe species, they classify those species into bigger groups, they do phylogenetic analysis, they teach taxonomy to others and identification of species, they do work in collections, uh, curating collections, but also identifying specimens, collecting specimens, and identifying other people's uh, uh, specimens. Uh, and they also publish, and what I'm really focusing on today is their publication output as one of the primary outputs of taxonomy. So to do that, you obviously need to get literature, and we're using the Open Alex API, uh, which is a 100% free and open source of uh, biological and other scientific literature. And we're also getting some of the data we use from Wikidata as well. So this is roughly, very roughly, our workflow. Uh, we select taxonomic journals basically by saying, uh, does it have an IPNI ID or does it have a ZooBank ID and maybe a few other IDs as well from Wikidata. And that pulls us out a whole bunch of taxonomically related uh, journals. We're mostly looking at those articles from the last 10 years in those journals. Um, I'll, when, we, when I don't, I'll mention it. Um, and then that gives us a whole bunch of publications. We then look at the keywords and abstracts uh, and titles in those and pull out certain keywords that tend to identify the taxonomic papers within those taxonomic journals. And that gives us a big corpus of uh, scientific literature. We can look at the taxonomic profile of the species mentioned within there. Uh, we can also take out the authors and look at the affiliations of those authors from the publications. So we can easily filter those affiliations for whether they come from uh, European countries. Um, and uh, we can also look at things like people's first names to have some idea of people's gender, and I'll mention that in a moment. We can look at the time span that people have published from, their, their first publication to their last publication, and we can look at the affiliated country. Have we got everybody? Uh, well, if you do a sort of saturation curve, it's quite clear we probably have got everybody, almost. There is a certain amount of uh, false positives you get, but we've been, we've 
from our corpus of what we call taxonomic literature, we've proved that we've gone through there, checked that most of what we've got are what we would consider taxonomic literature. We've also taken a whole bunch of authors that we know are taxonomists, so all the taxonomists in our institution and checked that they've been included, and they were. We've also had a look at some of the ones that were included and gone back and looked at their literature and found out whether we really would consider them taxonomists, and they are. So just going to that gender balance, uh, there is quite a lot on gender balance. It's not a particular uh, gender-related uh, uh, study, but it is a, an interesting from a policy perspective. And so I, we thought it was worthwhile, and it's an interesting use case uh, for this kind of analysis. And what we did, uh, because we don't really want to assign people genders, we just looked at their first names. The reason it's rather noisy on the, in the 1970s here, and this is where uh, we took more than 10 years, is because in the 1970s and 1980s, you often get initials on the papers rather than full names, and so there's fewer people uh, on that. As you can see, um, it seems pretty much stagnant. There hasn't been much change in, in the last 20 years in the proportion of women working in taxonomy compared to men, and even if you assumed all the people in the inconclusive uh, range were women, then you still don't get quite as many as men. So. I find that's rather disappointing considering all the efforts have uh, been made uh, to encourage uh, women in science. Uh, but there, that's what the data shows us at the moment, and I'll just leave you with that, uh, something to think about. So just to give you some numbers before I dive into some of the data, um, in our corpus of scientific literature, we have uh, almost 34,000 publications. Uh, the authors on those are 46,000 of them, and we looked at 111 journals. I'm only focusing on Europe. This is a workflow that you could just repurpose for any country or any continent in the world. It's all on GitHub, it's open, and you can use it if you want to do it perfectly. Australia. Um, as you can see on here, there are fewer taxonomists in Northern and uh, Eastern Europe compared to Western Europe. But on a per capita basis, if you look at the same, it turns out actually that uh, Scandinavia, Iceland, Norway, Estonia, um, all have quite a lot of taxonomists on a per capita basis. And for some reason, Switzerland seems to have the most. There's still an east-west uh, bias, but not as much when you look at the total numbers of taxonomists. So other numbers, 63% uh, have an orchid, which is kind of interesting, but not a great number. Uh, on average, uh, the authors have two publications each. 45% of those open access and 3,000 500 uh, institutions. And I did actually question this, uh, 3,500 is a lot of institutions, and the way Open Alex works is if it's a, a med medical uh, hospital associated with the university, that would be a separate institution to the university itself, and so you do get some inflation of those numbers. When you look at the taxonomic profile, uh, these are the top four, they're all plant families. Um, they're all families with a lot of species in, so it's not surprising that they come up the top. Uh, and they're all families that have uh, crop relatives in them. And so, again, not really surprising that they're of interest to people. So one of my bugbears when people do gap analyses is they often only look at, say, the supply side, and then they say, oh, well, there's not many people working on some obscure insect, and so there must be a gap. Um, there's no gap unless there's no need demand for that, and, and species aren't created equal. Some species are more policy relevant than others. And so we wanted to really look at at least some of the uh, supply, the demand side drivers for this, and uh, we have three here. One of them, uh, we took the IUCN red listed species for Europe and looked at those that were marked as requiring taxonomy. Um, and we have that, we have all the crop wild relatives that are in Europe, and we have uh, a horizon scanning for Europe uh, for invasive species as well. And we can look at the taxonomic profile of all of those species. So I'm gonna have to be really quick now. So um, I will skip some of the last bits, but this on the left, you see all the, uh, the darker green that is, is where you have more taxonomists. Um, obviously, they work more on dicots than on monocots and less other things. And on the right-hand side, you see all of the demand for taxonomists. And as you can see, there is some correlation there. But if you try to correlate this, uh, you get something like this. Um, and 
the more taxonomists you have, the more demand you get. But in the bottom right-hand corner, there are orders of plants where you have a lot of taxonomists working on them and no demand whatsoever. You can look at the red-listed ones, and interestingly enough, uh, the ones in the top left are where you have a few taxonomists and a lot of species. And it turns out that there are a lot of mosses there. And the reason for that being in red-listed is because uh, there was a big project on red-listing bryophytes, and that's why they're there. And so to some extent, that proves that in this, uh, there's a chicken and egg problem. Uh, if you have more taxonomists, you get them red-listing more of that particular taxa. I will skip over invasive species, except to say there's very little correlation there. And crop oil relatives, there's a bigger correlation. So uh, you can put those all together and look at the supply and demand. And you can see in actual fact, apart from some exceptions, there is actually not much correlation between the supply and demand of taxonomists. And of course, that may be because there are other uh, demands there. And potentially, if you look at the orders on the top, bottom right, where you've got lots of taxonomists working and no demand for them, you might find other demands of why they're working on those particular orders. So we did animals, we did fungi, we haven't analyzed them yet, and that's it. But this is meant to be controversial. Um, taxonomists don't want to be considered uh, in terms of this supply and demand, but I think because there's only fin uh, limited finance out there, we have to think this way. Institutions have to think who they're going to employ and what they're going to employ them to do. And so I think that's why this kind of analysis is still useful. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you want to come and use this microphone? <laughs> uh, thank you, Quentin. Uh, we have got time for questions. Are there any questions when I try to fix the other microphone? I guess, yeah, I don't see another mic anywhere. Oh. I'll say my question from here. So, you, you said that the, the corpus you were using was particularly stuff that was open, um, or at least you said it was... No, it's not open literature at all. It's closed literature. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, so you don't see any bias there that would have made, let you to have more open access publications. No. And do you think there's any... Probably that it doesn't matter. I was going to wonder, therefore, whether there was therefore a bias towards the more significant consumer-related topics being more in potentially paid journals and therefore less accessible and less visible, but perhaps not in that case. No, I don't think they, sh they shouldn't be. There may be other biases, but uh, not that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Elspeth from Edinburgh. Um, I don't know if it's, uh, it should be possible. Are you, are you seeing or have, have you looked at any shifts in and changes in in um, the research and the, the, the families and the taxa that are being studied? No, because of, apart from looking at gender over the last 50 years, we've actually only been working at the most recent things and uh, it would be quite difficult to do. Obviously, you saw the, the, the data are quite noisy anyway. Um, so, and to see a difference, a trend that you would actually recognize, you'd have to have some pretty obvious trends, I think, and I, I'm not sure we'd see something so obvious. Does it work? Oh. So, I'm sorry I missed the very start, but you're looking at authors as individuals, yes? Yes. Yeah. But, um, um, I mean, commonly authors often work in teams, so I wonder if, um, if you could detect anything like uh, patronage networks, where um, a mentor helps a load of people through and into the science in, 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 work, in work like this. We have talked about doing networks on this, I and mean, we have all the data, we know who who has co-authored with who, and so we definitely could do this. We've just actually run out of money to do any more of this work. We've got way over budget on it, um, and so uh, I would love to be able to do that. And we have, it's so easy to get the data too, and it's frustrating. But. That would be a good topic to, um, to make links with like other branches of science where they're looking at participation yes. in science. Yeah. A really quick question. 
one minute. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Quentin. Just a small one. Um, what's your plan? How are you going to use this data? We'll publish a paper. <laughs> 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 That's what we do, <laughs> uh, and the code the code is out there for anybody to use. I think it'd be interesting to repurpose this for other other areas. Um, and there's so much more you can do with this kind of data. And so part of this talk was to advertise the approach as well as uh, the results. Okay, because my understanding, so with this, you know, you're really pointing and bringing awareness to the people. Okay, where does this shift? And let's say, you know, where people work in most of it and maybe something in understudy and underrepresented and the effort wasn't put there because, yes, those are economically important species that have to be studied. So, you know, that's that's why my understanding that you might use it, you know, in some policy making or bring more awareness. Well, we're funded by the European Union yeah. uh, and they do want us to... Uh, be policy relevant and I think uh, quite possibly later on in the project you might be doing things like uh, uh, policy brief type things where some of this information will come in. Certainly we're looking for information that's relevant for policy. Yeah, so not, not just a paper. No. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Next, speak, next up is Yusuf Sklav. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Yusuf will be talking uh, talk to us about uh, extracting mass from a 